Jesus loves the church. Jesus, Jesus made a claim that his people, his church, was his body. To claim them as his body is to say that he is intimately connected to this group of people. He is part of them and they are part of him. Jesus says that you are my church. The Bible uses a word for church that basically means an assembly. And so you could say that there were a lot of churches during that time. Uh, those who would gather for government activities, they could be called a church. Those who would gather for other religious events, uh, assemblies of families, and the, the list could go on and on and on. Jesus says that you are my assembly of people. And before he goes to the cross, Jesus says that people are going to know that you are my people, my assembly, by the love that you show. Now, right before Jesus goes off to show us the greatest act of love ever presented to any human, he tells his followers, if you say that you love me, you will follow my commands. One of them being what I'm about to do for you and for the rest of the world in just a few hours. And as we've seen in Mark 12, when Jesus is asked about the greatest of all commands, he says, well, there are two that go hand in hand. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. And we see Jesus summarize that again in John 13, 34, when he says, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. This is how everyone is going to know that you are my disciples. Now, if you've been at a church for even a short period of time, you've probably picked up that the church should be the most loving, caring, compassionate group of people here on this earth, right? We should also be the most dedicated to our mission because that mission has been given to us by God himself. The message that was given to us by the head of the church, Jesus, is you need to love one another. And that seems pretty cut and dry. The Apostle Paul uh, when he writes to the Ephesian church, he says this, that, that love plays out through unity. He says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and there is one spirit. The picture being portrayed by Paul and the other apostles is that, is that of a church that is working like a well-oiled machine. All the parts are moving in sync. Now, we can't achieve that through wishful thinking, right? We can't snap into existence. If we could, then there would, been a, there would be no need for the apostles to, to pen letters to the early churches. There is no need for a New Testament if doing this thing called being in unity with one another comes naturally to us. I would say that the scriptures paint a pretty clear picture that this isn't natural and it's a life that takes practice, it takes patience, and a whole lot of grace for one another. But the thing is, team building is never an easy task, whether you're in the church or not. Most of the stories we see uh, where, where people are thrown together involve conflict, they involve struggle, they, they involve giving up of self, and, and finally, 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 hopefully working together as a team. I like movies, and I've always loved the movie Remember the Titans. If you remember that, it came back, I think, in the early 2000s. If you're not familiar with the movie, it's a story of a group of Southern high school football players that are thrown together in the 1970s right in the midst of school integration. A black school and a white school are joined together to become T.C. Williams High School in Alexandra, uh, Virginia. They would go on to become... Um, one of the only integrated schools and football teams in that area during that time. Well, you can imagine the conflict and the strife that went into this experiment of putting these two very different schools together. Just take a look around us, and I think we can get a better understanding of what was going on during that time. The, the movie is a timeless story because in the end, the football team does succeed in, in coming together as black and white and ends up winning the state championship. And if you're from the South, you know how big of a deal that is for high school. Uh, the message of the movie is that even with our differences, our differences in opinion, uh, our differences in life, we can move together and be united. And it took an enormous amount of hard work for the team to do that. It took people giving up some of their own dreams and visions of how a football program should be run. It took kids and adults stepping down from positions that had defined them to new roles to allow the team to succeed. And in the end, the message is of sacrifice. It's of uh, sacrifice of self so that we can be united as a family, even though we are different. 
this is the message for the church. The theme over the last couple weeks is, won't you be my neighbor? We've taken some fun cues from Mr. Rogers and we've walked through, through this theme together. And our conversation has been centered on what Jesus said are the greatest commands. So we, take a, uh, we took a, a look at the question that was being asked and the man who asked the question. We talked about the first part of the command that tells us that we should love God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And, the, and last week we took a quick look at what it means to love our first neighbor. That would be ourselves. And we made sure to reinforce the idea that loving ourselves isn't the most important love, but it is an action that can allow us to better serve and love those around us. Because after all, if we aren't filled up with the good stuff, then we don't have the good stuff to share. And the Holy Spirit offers that good stuff to us freely. Now, to get back to Mr. Rogers for a minute, because after all, that's, that's all you're going to remember from this message in the series anyway. Well, when Mr. Rogers invited us into his world, it wasn't just so that we could sit in the living room and watch him feed his fish and show us a show on the picture picture. Mr. Rogers, he, he welcomed us into his neighborhood. And what is a neighborhood? A neighborhood is a collection of people all grouped together in a certain area or location. And each and every time that we got together with Mr. Rogers, this actually is a picture of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. We, when we got together with Mr. Rogers, we didn't stay in the house, but he took us on an adventure through the neighborhood around him and through his neighborhood of make-believe as well. His goal was to give us a wider view of the world and of the people that are all around us. Now, a neighborhood is a collection of people who might be similar, but who could also be very, very different. And this is what the church is as well. A group of people who are following Jesus, but who come from, they come from very different places, different experiences, and maybe even different beliefs. They may hold different beliefs or opinions. Now, America has been called the, the great melting pot of the world. But to tell you what, tell you what, the, the early church held that title long before we ever did. If you look back through the story of the early church, specifically in books like Acts, you see a group of people who in every other social setting did not belong in the same room. First off, you had a church that started because of a, a Jewish Messiah. And so the Jewish people, a, a people that were known for keeping to themselves, keeping themselves separate from everyone around them, they lay the foundation for the church. And then as the gospel message spread and was shown to be salvation for all the peoples of the world, other people groups started to get in on this growing movement. You had the wealthy, you had the poor, you had the strict rule keepers, and you had the outlaws. You had those who knew everything about the Old Testament scriptures and those who had never seen a sacred text in their lives. You had the, the powerful and you had the powerless. You had prisoners and you had prison guards, everyone fellowshipping with one another. The thing about Jesus' church is that anyone can find a place. And what happens when you have different uh, people coming from different places? You have a lot of different opinions. And what happens when you have a lot of different opinions? You have a lot of disagreement. And this is what the apostles were seeing, and this is why we have the New Testament letters. If you get down to the bare bones of what the letters are, they contain writing about who Jesus is and what he has done, and they talk about what it actually means to live out Jesus' commands. These are some of the, the practical ways in which love plays out in our lives. And the Apostle Paul pens one of many very passionate pleas for a church to be a group of people who live out this command to love their God and let that love flow out into other people's lives. I want us to take a, a, a little peek at the book of Romans chapter 12. So whatever your preferred method of reading the Bible is, I invite you to turn to Romans 12 with me. It's in the New Testament. Uh, like most of his letters, Paul spells out a theological argument for Jesus as Messiah, what it looks like and what it means to enter into the kingdom of God. Then he caps off the letter with a call for those followers of Jesus to live a life that is dependent on the gospel that he has revealed. So in chapter 12 of Romans, we see the start of Paul's plea for what a follower of Jesus' life should look like. And in Romans 12, Romans 12 starts out and says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good and pleasing in the perfect will of God. 
For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each and every one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching in teaching, if exhorting in exhortation, giving with generosity, leading with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. Verse 9 says this, let, let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Verse 14, bless those who are persecuted, or, or who persecute you, bless, and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another, and do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourself. Instead, leave room for God's wrath, because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will heap fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Paul spent the first part of his letter outlining what the grace of Jesus looks like, reminding his audience of, of the call that they have received and the new life that they have been given through Jesus. He's talked about to them about the law and the fulfillment of the law by Jesus, and he says, therefore, at the beginning of this chapter, therefore, therefore, because, because you and I have been given this great gift, our lives are being marked by certain things. And he, he's talking to the church here, brothers and sisters, he says. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true act of worship. Now, before Jesus, uh, the practice in that culture, especially the Jewish culture, is uh, we used to put dead animals on the altar in order to worship God. But now, because Jesus took on the cross, we no longer use dead animals, but we ourselves have become living sacrifices living beings that walk around worshiping our Lord and Savior and following his commands. Love the Lord our God and love others as ourselves. The thing about a dead sacrifice is that there's, there's a limited time, a limited place, and a limited gathering that is going to witness or even benefit from the offering. No matter the religious sacrificial system you took part in, they all had a certain place, they all had a certain time, and they were all done a certain way, or else you missed the message. You missed the blessing, so to speak. A living sacrifice is different. A living sacrifice can go wherever it wants, whenever it wants, and however it wants. A living sacri sacrifice can be seen not just by a few people, but by everyone you come in contact with. And Paul says in verse 2 of chapter 12 that you are not, uh, that you are only able to do this, excuse me, you're only able to do this because you have your eyes firmly planted on God and your mind and your thoughts and your actions are being directed by His will. And then Paul says, don't get too big of a head. Well, he didn't say that quite that way, but he writes, for by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Paul was a hero in the church, a spokesman, if you will. He knew that he had a lot of influence and pull, and when he spoke, people would listen to him. But he says that this is a grace that has been given to him. He didn't earn it. He didn't have to work for it. This is a, a this grace of being a leader in a church only came because it was God's plan. And when he says that we need to make sure, uh, he he says we need to make sure that we, we don't think too highly of ourselves. And, and when he's saying that, he's including himself in that list. Paul knows that this church is made up of many different kinds of people. And again, when different kinds of people get together, you get all sorts of different opinions and different ways of seeing the world. And the temptation is to say or to think, my way is the way. Well, you, you might be thinking that I'm not that arrogant. I've never really said that. I've never given the my way or the highway kind of talk. Uh, that may be the case, but I'm 100% sure, 100% confident that we've been part of a group or tribes where that has been the message. 
We don't have to go any further than our own political parties. And I'm sure that most of us here would put ourselves in one camp or the other if we're thinking of two main parties. If you're a Republican, the message that you are hearing or that you may be even giving is we are the only ones with the answers to move this country forward. If you are a Democrat, the message that you are hearing or that you may be giving is that we are the only ones with the answers to move this country forward. And so you have shouting from both sides, both extremes, saying that they are the only way to be a real patriot. And the only way to do that is to be a real patriot and join our cause. I would hope, I would hope that we could all see that on both sides, there really isn't a lot of humility being, being put on display right now. Paul says that gaining a realistic view of ourselves can move us into a, the lane of humility. And humility allows us to let some, let some things go, to give up on some expectations, to, to open ourselves up to the possibility that our way, our thoughts, our ideas are, are not the only ones out there. And, and in order for the church to work, we have to be willing to give up in order to gain more. Uh, Pastor Anley Stan, Stanley says it this way, the church looks more like Christ when we are giving away rather than we, when we are demanding our way. The church looks more like Christ when we are giving away rather than when we are demanding our way. One of the ways that this play, plays out in how we interact with one another is Christ's body here on the earth. We recognize that each and every one of us has a part to play. We each have different gifts and different parts to play, and we, we can't get hung up on thinking that we, we're the ones bringing the most value to the table. There, there's no climbing the ladder in the church. That's, the, that's what the world has to do. In order to have a bigger voice or more influence or more control, in order to be seen, you have to get yourself at, at the table. You have to work for that promotion. You have to perform for your bosses or, or the higher ups. But Paul says that we are already at the table. Each and every one of us has been given a seat at the table, and so there should be no jockeying for power or position. We are all children of God, and as children, we've been given an inheritance. Jens Beck is actually going to be speaking about that next week, and I've heard his message. It's fantastic, and it's timely, and you are not going to want to miss it next week. Seeing ourselves in the right light uh, is why we talk, it's part of the, the way we talk about uh, excuse me, seeing ourselves in the right light is, is why we talked about loving ourselves last week. We will have a hard time being a contributing part of the body if we think we have no worth. We will have a hard time being a contributing part of the body if we are plagued with a high view of ourselves. So in order to start living the life that Jesus wants for us, we have to come to the end of ourselves as well as come to the beginning of ourselves. Let me say that again. We need to come to the end of ourselves and we need to come to the beginning of ourselves. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We come to the end of ourselves by realizing we were, we were sinners, or we still are a sinner separated from God. But we come to the beginning of ourselves, holding on to the truth that we have been declared righteous. We are free from the bondage of this world, and we are sons and daughters of God. And sonship with God can never be lost. And when something can't be lost, that means we should live like we have nothing to lose. We are free to be a living sacrifice. Paul takes us through a, a checklist in verses 9 through 21 uh, of, of ways that a follower of Jesus presents himself as a living sacrifice to God. Here, here's a few of them. Here's a few of the highlights. See if you can find them and, and pull them out as, as I go through just a, a couple of them. We cling to what is good. We love one another deeply. We outdo one another in showing honor. We share with the saints. We welcome the stranger. We bless those who, who persecute us, and we, we don't curse them. We live in harmony with one another. We do not repay evil with evil. We give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. And if at all possible, we live at peace with everyone. What do these all have in common? They all require us to pay attention to someone else. They all require uh, for us to, to take our eyes off of ourselves. And what's also great is that Paul reminds us that this, this list of things isn't just for the people that we like or the people who are like us. Bless those who persecute you. Give a blessing to those who mean you harm. Give a blessing to those who want to shut you down or who want to cancel you. This was radical stuff for those early churches. And it looks like it's going to become more and more radical in the world that we are living in ourselves. So let me get a little honest here, all right? Don't turn me off yet. 
Let me get a little honest here. The American church isn't doing a very good job at this, this right now. And I, I say the American church, not Faith Bible Church, because frankly, there is a church culture that has grown over many, many, many years and decades that has bought into this idea that our mission is to save the American dream. And the American dream is based on my rights, my liberty, and my pursuit of happiness. When the scriptures were written, there was no America. And there's no earthly government, style, or structure that can exclusively lay claim to the kingdom of God. Some are better and some are worse. Yeah. The church, to quote Andy Stanley again, the church looks more like Christ when we are defending other people's rights rather than our own. And our system of government pushes us into looking towards our own rights. And frankly, I think as well as some other pastors think that we've missed the boat. Maybe there's still turn, time to turn this around, but we've missed a moment. We've missed the boat over the last couple of things. Now, what do I, over the last couple of months, what do I mean by missing the boat? We've gone through something we've never been through in our lives, and there's a chance that we will be walking down this path for a while longer. We've been through a pandemic, we've been through an economic collapse, and to add to the story, we're in the middle of an election year. I'm 44 years old, and I can't remember any time in my life that held so much uncertainty, so much fear, so much anxiety, and so much division for this country. And folks, the church seems to be missing the boat. Early on during this pandemic, it was, it was so thrilling to see churches all over the country start to pivot in the way that they operated to, to better meet the needs of their people and their communities. We tried to do a bit of it here at FBC. Churches all over the country started food programs. We saw faith communities helping out local businesses. We were prayerfully considering ideas to help deal with the stress and the anxiety that comes from being shaken from our normal routines. There were efforts to address the issue of giving kids the education that they needed when the school doors were closed. The message early on was, there is hope in a world that looks hopeless. But then somewhere around May, the message changed. Christians were tired. We were tired just like our neighbors. We became a people more concerned about getting back to normal rather than providing solutions for this new normal. We started to focus on our rights and the message seemed to shift away from what is happening in our community to how quickly can we open our doors. And the American church has become another critic in a long line of critics out there. Now, I am not saying, you know, don't turn me off yet. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have opinions about what is going on around us. I myself have some pretty strong opinions about how the last few months have been handled overall. And I am ready to go into a store without a mask. Yes. And I am ready to have the movie theaters and the other businesses in our local communities be, be given the go ahead to, to fully reopen. Yes. But in the process of fixing my eyes and what I want, uh, I've forgotten that uh, that no matter how serious we think this crisis is, the reality is we are all walking through something together. And the loud voices are busy competing for attention. And the critics are out in full force. But what our friends and our neighbors might just need is a hand with a cup of water and the hope that comes from the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The world is full of critics. What it needs instead is a people of compassion. And a lot of times people of compassion get stomped on. They get taken advantage of and they may even feel like they don't have any power. But again, what did Jesus say? Did he say that the powerful and the self-righteous would inherit the kingdom of heaven? Nope. He said that the poor in spirit, the humble, the merciful, the persecuted. The world is becoming more and more overrun by critics. It's becoming full of voices seeking to gain power or, or even total control over the conversation. The messages that we've been experiencing all around us are one of destruction instead of life. I'm going to tear you down. I'm going to tear you down. All that kind of stuff. This is why we've camped on the commands of Jesus found in Mark chapter 12 and, and centered our idea uh, on that message. Jesus brings life and the body of Christ should be following suit and bringing life to the world around them, the world around us. The, the church has always had its ups and downs. We're, we're human after all. It's obvious that the world around us is not working according to God's kingdom. But we as the church get to invite kingdom moments into each and every day. 
Over the centuries, the church has experienced periods of rebirth as it takes a fresh hold on its mission and its purpose. It usually takes a shaking. Oftentimes, it takes a crisis. And I'll tell you what, when I feel like the world is crashing down on me, where everything is going wrong, my natural reaction is to turn my eyes right in. My circle gets really small. If you're going to attack me, my circle gets really small. And when my circle gets really small, I forget that God is in control. And I start scraping and scratching to try to gain control for myself. The claws might even come out if I feel like I'm being attacked. It's hard to make someone feel like you love them if you are in the attack position. At the end of this section of scripture, Paul tells us to leave wrath and vengeance for God. Verse 19 says, Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. God is the one who deserves to cast judgment. He is the only one who can actually do it properly. Frankly, Paul just means that God is in control and he needs to be given that control. And he's asking this church to believe and act in a way that shows God is in control. The big question is, are we responding to our current set of circumstances Um, Do we live our life as if God is in control or are we depending on something else to bring us a sense of security, prosperity, and hope in this uncertain time?